It's Kate, and this is the second video for week 8 of Math 23. Now that we've talked a little bit about the definition of the derivative, let's talk about the behavior of differentiable functions. These are basically going to allow us to justify some of our procedures when we're looking for critical points of a function, which is very important in several applications of mathematics. So if we have a function that's defined on an open interval, and it achieves its maximum or minimum at some x0 and is differentiable there, then the derivative at that particular point is equal to zero. That's probably not news to anybody. There's also Rawls theorem, very interesting theorem, saying that if we have a function that's continuous on some closed interval and it's differentiable on the largest open interval in that closed interval with the two function values at the endpoints being equal to each other, then there exists at least one input on that open interval such that the derivative there is equal to zero. You can sketch a few examples and it makes complete and perfect sense, but of course the theorems that make complete perfect sense are the ones that are most difficult to prove. For the mean value theorem, we say that if f is continuous on some closed interval from a to b and it's differentiable on the open, largest open interval in that closed interval, then there exists at least one element in that open interval such that the derivative there is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now this is interesting because this is also the average rate of change between the endpoints of the interval. You probably did some average rate of change questions in your univariate calculus class. But also, graphically speaking, what does this look like? Well, if we have some function on a closed interval like that, the average rate of change is the slope of the secant line between the two endpoints. And what this is saying is that somewhere on this interval, that the slope of that secant line is the same as the slope of the tangent line at some point there, maybe here. We're also told that if f, a function, is differentiable on the open interval from a to b and its derivative is zero for all elements on that open interval, then in fact f is a constant function on that open interval. And if f and g are both differentiable functions on the open interval from a to b such that f prime is equal to g prime, i.e. their function derivatives are the same everywhere on that interval, then there exists a constant c by which they differ, meaning that for all x on the open interval, f of x is equal to g of x plus c. Note that c could be zero. They could be exactly the same function, or c could be some positive number or negative number. But regardless, if their function derivatives are the same everywhere, that means that they are the same function simply translated vertically. Now let's take a look at inverse functions and their derivatives. Note that there's a corollary of the intermediate value theorem, which is saying that if a function is continuous and one to one on an interval, which means that it must be either strictly increasing or strictly decreasing. Well, first of all, why is that? Well, if we picture a function that is not strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, and then we remind ourselves what it really means to be one to one, which is saying that if two outputs are equal, that must mean they come from the same input. Let's look here. We certainly do have two outputs, say along this line. We really even have three, but do they come from the same input? Nope, not at all. There's one that's here, one that's here, and one that's there. So that's why a function, you can see, that sort of breaks down when it's not strictly increasing, then it's not one-to-one. -one. So we have a function that is continuous and one-to-one -one on an interval, then there is a continuous inverse function f inverse, whose domain is the interval j, which is whatever happens to the interval when f acts on it. Other things that should not surprise you, that if we take f and compose it with its inverse, or we take f inverse and compose it with f, we get the identity function either way. So how do we figure out what the inverse function's derivative is? Well, we know that if f composed with f inverse, acting on y just returns y because f composed with f inverse is the identity function, then the chain rule states that we can take the derivative of both sides with respect to y. Remember we take the derivative of the outside function times the derivative of the inside function and then the derivative of y with respect to itself is just 1 and f prime f inverse of y is not equal to 0, specifically this term right here. We can divide by this term and find that the inverse function's derivative at the point y is equal to 1 divided by f prime f inverse of y. Let's take a look at this example. Say our function f is 
tangent of x. And our interval that we care about is from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Then our inverse function is, of course, going to be arctan of y. Now, we already know that the derivative of arctan is 1 over 1 plus y squared. But let's show how this idea can get us there. We want to find the derivative of arctan of y with respect to y. We take the advice of this particular step. We do 1 over the derivative of f, f is tangent, where f is composed with f inverse y. So the derivative of tangent of arctan y. Well, the derivative of tangent of arctan y would be secant squared arctan y. And this is all of f inverse y. So now we need to figure out one, what 1 over secant squared arctan y is. What I like to do is set it up using a right triangle. Here we go. Here's my right triangle, and note that I have this angle, theta, that I care about. Because we have secant squared of arctan of y. Arctan y means the angle whose tangent measure is theta. So, well, what, what does that mean? Well, the tangent measure is opposite over adjacent, so that means opposite over adjacent needs to be equal to y. Let's make that as simple as possible. There we go. Now we have this third side of the triangle, the hypotenuse, which we can actually fill in using the Pythagorean theorem. Now the question is basically saying that I want to take secant squared of this angle. Well, secant squared is just 1 over cosine squared. And cosine squared of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse squared. So let's compute that. Now, now all we have to do is algebraically simplify. Remember that this is secant squared. This, when we simplify it, is 1 plus y squared. And of course, we want to take 1 over secant squared, so we end up with 1 over 1 plus y squared. Now the problem is that as we get into taking higher order derivatives, we really need to make sure that a function's derivatives themselves are differentiable. So our challenge as we sort of move forward and we get into more complicated theorems is figuring out whether f prime itself is differentiable. So that's what we'll be turning our attention to later.